Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, well, I'm an alcoholic. That's my main credential for being here. Uh, I've been sober since 24th of July, 1993. Um, uh, I've sponsored a few hundred people. Um, uh, I've talked to many hundreds, if not thousands more. Uh, frankly, I think most of the people we sponsor wouldn't call us their sponsors. We don't think of ourselves as their sponsors. But if I take input from someone, that's really what I'm doing. I'm taking sponsorship from them, whether it's a live person, um, a piece of literature, a tape. Some of the best sponsorship I've had is from tapes. You can't answer back. You can't argue. You just have to do what they say. Um, now, if, if you're very, very brave, you can go on Facebook and you can join one of those lovely big book groups on Facebook. If you like, if you like an argument, go on to one of those and ask the question, where does it say sponsorship in the big book? It's not in the first 164 pa-. And you can have the most almighty argument. If you've got borderline personality disorder, you'll love it. You go in somewhere, ask an innocent question, get your popcorn and just sit back while everyone argues about it. I don't care whether it's in the big book, it helped me. Now, the fact is, it's like forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't technically in there on pages 66 and 67, which are the forgiveness passages. When you look up forgiveness in the Oxford, or forgive in the Oxford English Dictionary, certainly the Diffusion Dictionary, the Lexico, it says to forgive is to stop being angry. There we go, to stop being angry. And what is page 66 and 67 about? It's about stopping being angry. So the fact the word forgiveness isn't in there is irrelevant. The content, it's the content that matters, not the terminology. Uh, The word sponsor is, is not in there. But unfortunately, the bloke that wrote the book, Bill W., did refer to his sponsor, Ebby. Um. So I, I'm not a sort of legalistic person when it comes to AA. If you want a legalistic person, I'll give you some names and numbers. <laughs> there are plenty of them around, and I'm not one of them. So I had uh, sponsors right from the beginning. Uh, I've had lots of sponsors over the year. I've got a formal sponsor at the moment, um, and I've had him as my sponsor for 12 or 13 years. Um, so the, what is the content of sponsorship? Um, and this is talked about in the big book. So you, you look at chapter seven and you, you've got someone that wants to join AA and follow the process that AA offers. And what, what is sponsorship for that person? It's presenting adequately what the AA program is. And if they want to go through with it, in other words, if they want to take the step three decision and take the subsequent actions, then you're willing to uh, share with them your practical experience and guide them through it. That's the formal side of things. Uh, but... I, oh dear, I'm going to get controversial already. Um, not a moment too soon, I know one or two of you will say. Uh, I was brought up in AA with lots of tapes. So Maureen used to send me a tape every week. Uh, she used to record it from a, one, one tape to another. She would get them and she would make copies for people put them in little packages, take them to the post office and send them out to people. And I I relied on these. This was this was before the Internet and uh, and where you had your local meetings. You couldn't go to meetings around the world or access AA from anywhere else. So if your local meetings were rotten, but you had tapes, you were okay. You could hear a message from somewhere else, which is very important. And. 
A number of the tapes I heard in the first year were from members of um, uh, the Pacific Group in uh, Los Angeles, Brentwood. Uh, and in particular, a, a speaker called Clancy, who talked about a very strong form of sponsorship, which is uh, <laughs> barking truth at your sponsee. And I have to say, I love, I love all that. I'll tell you why. Um, over the years, I've had to make... Oh, this is where I have to move. This the cleaner chap's coming in, so I need to leave him in peace as much as him me. Um, when I was new in recovery, I couldn't find my ass with both hands. Um, I had an incredibly difficult first two years. And I came to AA with zero life skills, zero, no clue about anything. I came from what is a functional family. My family were about as much use as a chocolate teapot. And also, I, I, I'm going to swear. If you don't like swearing, put, put cheese in your ears. But I'm going to swear. I was full of shit when I got sober. I believed all sorts of things which were nonsense, which were not true, and which were not helping me. If I hadn't had people to call me out robustly, I'd be dead, D-E-A-D. -E um, people weren't unkind. There's nothing unkind about being direct. Uh, if ever you've had to go to accident and emergency, or the emergency room, as it's called in America... They're perfectly nice, but they've got a job to do, and they get on with the job. They get on with the job quickly. They're not unkind, but they don't sit there patting your damn little hand either. They do what needs to be done, they say what needs to be said, and they go on to the next patient. And this is what uh, my early sponsors were like. I'm in wonderful at getting people to pat my damp little hands and tell me it's going to be okay tell me how wonderful I am, how much they love me. Oh, I was in a meeting a few days ago where, where they said, oh, you know, the, the program works because of love. I, on one level, that's true. And maybe we'll come to that. But certainly the forms of love that I was exposed to before I came to AA didn't me, do me the blindest bit of good. They didn't cure my alcoholism at all. Uh, I needed someone to understand my position because they'd been in it, help me understand my position, which I was in, and give me a clear path out of it, clear directions about how to get out of it. Um, and that's what people gave me. And when I was, when I talked rubbish or was evasive or difficult or resistant, and I was immensely resistant for years, frankly, I, you know, I didn't become nice. I'm not sure I have yet, but I didn't become nice when I got to AA suddenly. I didn't become particularly compliant um, with, with a lot of things. Uh, and I gave people, I really gave people the runaround. And my real models in my early days were uh, Maureen and Sue and Doug. Doug was my formal sponsor. Maureen uh, was about 17 years sober at the time. Sue was around 30 years sober. Her nickname was Angry Sue. This gives you a little bit of insight into... Now, I don't think she was angry. I think people experienced her as angry because she challenged them. Uh, I've got a friend in uh, who lives in Westchester County where the, the culture seems to be, if you don't like what someone says, you accuse them of yelling at you. And I think that's what happened with, uh, with Sue. Um, I remember phoning her up from, from a, a, a telephone box, if anyone remembers what one of those is. Explain that to the children. They'll, they'll need that explaining. Telephone box. Um, and it was 10 to 11, and at the time, the off-licences in London closed at 11. So I was going to have to make a pretty sharp decision about whether or not I was going to drink that night, because I was very thirsty. And I phoned Sue, um, and, I, I, and she picked up the phone at 10 to 11. 
10 to 11, she picked up the phone and, and I said, Sue, I want to drink. And she said, oh, do you? AA is for people who don't want to drink. Click. That was the end of the conversation. Now, I think quickly. Even then, I thought on my feet. And I realized I had to stop playing games. If I wanted a conversation with Sue, I had to stop playing games. It's funny how even in a very, I was very mentally ill when I got to AA, but the little calculator machine about how to manipulate situations, how to get my own way, was absolutely intact. And I thought to myself, uh, I know what I'll say to Sue. I said, I phoned her up again and I said, I don't want to drink, but I'm frightened I'm going to. And she said, now we're in business. And then we had a, a real conversation. I'm moving around the office just to try and find the quietest spot. Um, I remember a particular conversation with Maureen where I, I, I managed to get her on the phone on Saturday night. That was quite a coup. You know, you're bored, it's Saturday night, you're at home, what do you do? You phone an old-timer and uh, threaten suicide. Uh, pretty effective at getting people on. It gets people's attention, I'll tell you that. And I said, um, I don't think I'm gonna, going to be able to do a step four. And she said, why not? And I said, because I can communicate effectively only through the means of poetry. And she said, this was Wimbledon housewife. She said, horse shit. You're a common or garden alcoholic. And don't you forget it. This has worked for millions of other people. You are not fundamentally different than the rest. You're conceited but you're not fundamentally different than the rest. Without that straight talking, I would be dead. I got into uh, the most terrible pickle when I was around 16 years, 15, 16 years sober with what we refer to as an al slip. An al slip is where you get unhealthily entangled with the fate of another alcoholic or addict. And I got enmeshed in all sorts of unhelpful ways. And I found a kindly old timer to, to, as it were, help me sit with my feelings about this situation for about three months. And we talked and we emailed and there was lots of compassion going back and forth. And eventually I told my sponsor and my sponsor is fond of saying an honest man or an honest person, an honest alcoholic is one that eventually tells the truth. And I eventually came clean about my shenanigans. That's a technical term. My shenanigans with this alcoholic who was mid relapse. And he gave me the most almighty slap about it, gave me very clear instructions about how to extract myself uh, suitably and quickly from this dreadful situation. I followed it and it was like someone pulling a thorn out of a festering saw. The healing started immediately. The healing was not was unpleasant, but it started at the point of the slap. And when he gave me the slap, metaphorical slap, when he gave me the slap, um, I felt that the sky turned black because it, it upturned all of my beliefs about the situation and about a lot of other things as well. Uh, but I decided to trust him over myself. I decided to trust, trust his perception of the situation over my own perception of the situation because I was the one who was in trouble. And one of the things my sponsor says is I'd rather see someone following the mistaken advice of a well-meaning sponsor than their own best thinking. I've never, I mean, there, there, occasionally people do say idiot things in recovery. It's, it, it, it's not often. Uh, occasionally people, it, there is, there are damaging things which are said. I'm not going to say they never happen. But I tell you, of all the things I've ever had to make amends for, and there have been many, not one of them 
flowed from me following my sponsor's instructions. Every single thing I've ever had to make amends for, I came up with myself. I thought up with my own little noodle. I did not need any help to do that. So uh, sponsorship is incredibly important because it's not just um, having a guide through the 12 steps. Uh, it's having someone who's got your back, who knows you inside out, and who's willing to call you out when you're about to, to die of alcoholism through your own bad decision making. Maureen said trying to talk to people in AA is like trying to talk to people who are, who are skateboarding on the edge of a cliff with, with ear defenders on so they can't hear a thing that you're saying. Incredible danger. If you're in recovery and you're, un, and you're not recovered, you're not in a recovered position. Uh, if you, uh, I'll tell you what the seven death threats are. If you have resentment, if there is behavior in your life today which is harming other people, if you have secrets, if you have any amend which is unmade, any creditor which is unfaced, any complacency in your life about recovery, page 85. And then if your life is not built around work and self-sacrifice for others, the book says if any of those seven are operative, you're going to drink. It's a matter of when, not if. They use in Fred's story between pages 39 and 43 the, the idea they prophesied that at some point the defence would give way. And so those seven death threats are, uh, they're what I have to live by. I have to make sure that I'm clean on all of those seven in order to guarantee my continued sobriety. Until that point, and even when that point is reached, until that point, I, boy, do I need other people. Boy, have I needed other people to watch out for me because I'm, not, I'm unable to watch out for myself. Page 66. Um, resentment cuts me off from the sunlight of the spirit. And I tell you what, uh, all of those other six will as well. It's not just resentment which cuts a person off from the sunlight of the spirit. It's one secret is enough to separate me from the rest of humanity. Alcoholism, if you, I, I tell you, if you go to your home group, Let's say, especially if it's a physical home group, which has been around for years or has been around for decades. There are lots in London where the group has been around for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You go to that room and you ask yourself how many, in my case, because I'm 29, coming up to 29 years sober, how many people in this room are over 29 years sober? Almost none. Yet the room was full of people 29 years ago. Where are they? Mostly dead. Some have moved outside London. That's certainly the case in central London. Uh, there's an attrition rate because people leave and go and live in the country. Some people live in other countries. That's fine. But by God, do I have a lot of the people I've known who I knew in, my, in one particular home group in 1993. Over the years, one by one, they slipped. Most didn't come back. The ones who have stayed, the ones I know from 1993 who are still sober, they're not necessarily clever. They're not necessarily accomplished. They're not necessarily nice. What they are is devoted to AA. What they are is absolutely unswerving adherence to the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Anything less than that, good luck. This is, like, this is like a game of last man standing. I've got to make sure I'm not in the middle of the AA bed. I've, I've got to make sure I'm at the extremist end of AA, the people that dot the I's and cross the T's, because I don't want to take any chances. Someone I, kn I know from that home group in 1993 got to 30 years sober, the age of 60. Uh, wasn't really do he was doing lots of super spiritual things, helping lots of people. Um, marvelous meditation classes 
and but wasn't really doing AA, wasn't sponsoring people. And he had a glass of champagne to celebrate his 60th birthday. Within six months, he was uh, begging in the doorways of Soho to get money for crack. This isn't a game. Um, and my friend Davinda says, continuous sobriety doesn't keep you sober. The fact a person has been continuously sober for a period does not guarantee they will remain sober. This is why I'm foolish enough to still have a sponsor at 29 years. And I talk to him on a regular basis and I tell him what is going on. And if I've got a problem, I figure out the best solution I can based on the knowledge I have. And I take the problem and the solution that I figured out to him and say, have I missed anything? Have I got anything wrong? And when he suggests something, I do it on the same basis that I said earlier. Um, when he says, I'd rather see someone follow the bad advice of a well-meaning sponsor than their own best thinking. And I'm still willing to go against my own instinct to follow what he suggests. Not because he's wise, he is wise, but because he's not me friend of mine, a um, number of years sober, in a city somewhere. How's that for anonymous? Um, uh, rather bulks at this idea of referring to others for decision-making after many years, because does the big book not say we come to rely on our thinking, blah, blah, blah. And one of his lies is very interesting, because it bothered me at the time, and then I realised afterwards why. He said... Who knows me better than I do? Yeah, a couple of you winced at that. I might know a few things about myself, but my friends know better what the back of my head looks like than I do. I don't know what I look like from behind. Not really. If you want to ask what I'm really like, ask my other half. Ask the people I live with. Ask the people I work with ask my students, ask my colleagues. You will get keen insights, which somehow my keen mind has missed. So this works because I'm buried, I'm embedded in a network with a sponsor and with other people. Um, I do a quarterly review, uh, which covers my whole life, 360 degrees, looking for all possible character defects. I list them out, list out the uh, corrective measures and the sane and sound ideal. And I run it through with a number of people. And all of those people are effectively sponsoring me. I have one named sponsor, but I'm willing to follow the guidance of the group, the group conscience. And it, <laughs> this famous last words hasn't done me any harm. <laughs> I've got a great life and I'm sober. <laughs> what more do you want? Now, the actual nuts and bolts of this. Uh, why do I sponsor? Uh, last page of Dr. Bob's Nightmare explains it um, i've got a moral obligation to because how are people supposed to recover in aa without guidance someone has to do it and it has to come from within aa secondly i'm paying back the debt to the people that took time out of their busy lives to help me thirdly i enjoy it if you're not enjoying sponsoring other people you're not doing it right you need to learn how to do it right from people who are enjoying it it's huge fun challenging but it's huge fun um and also it's insurance against a slip i think there's a fifth reason he was four years sober when he wrote that i think if he was you know longer he might have added a fifth i don't know he might have added a fifth one uh, the steps get you only the first 11 steps get you only so far it's the 12th step that's taught me 95% of what I've needed to learn about myself and my relationships with other people and how to operate in the world. It's sponsorship. Service is great, you know, stacking the, stacking the proverbial chairs and emptying the proverbial ashtrays, great. Intergroup, area, district, region, all of those things, great. Being a GSR, great but it's not as high octane. It's not the good stuff. Like the good stuff is sponsoring. Um, 
how much time should a person spend sponsoring? Uh, enough that it hurts. I, don't, I certainly don't work as many hours in my, my my professional life as I would if I didn't have any sponsees. Well, there you go. Something has to give. Uh, it, it's simply how the cookie has crumbled with me. Other people do it differently. Uh, but I spend a lot of hours a week sponsoring. I'm also, people ask me, so I generally say yes, although we'll come to the prerequisites. Um, but it boils down to this. If I'm saying to God in the morning, direct my thinking, show me what to do today, and the phone keeps ringing, help, help, you know. I mean, you're not going to get an engraved invitation from God to say, you know, do this, do that. But um, people ask, crazy people being comfortable enough to talk to you is actually a pretty good sign. Um, how do you get sponsees? Um, they're hiding them at meetings. All of your potential sponsees are being carefully hidden by AA in the meetings. So you have to go to the meetings and you have to let people see who you are by sharing honestly and openly, not luridly, but honestly and openly about the problem, your understanding of the problem and the solution. And if they like what you have, they'll ask you. Um, the next thing I'm going to say is also controversial. I'm of the view that we broadcast, as it were, on particular frequencies to at attract particular people into our experience. Uh, and when people are not asking me to help them, I'm doing something wrong. There is something wrong with my spiritual status. I'm not broadcasting properly. Um, my friend Melody, many, this is back in 1993. Melody was wonderful. Uh, I remember six months sober, a year sober, a year and a half sober. She was always surrounded with little newcomers like ducklings clucking away with their Sloan Square accents and, and their, 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 their terrible troubles because they were comfortable with her and they knew she had a solution. She had a real touch with people. She was, she was great. She never had to work to find people. She got her own spiritual status sorted out. She had the willingness to help, a genuine willingness to help other people. It's her number one priority. She took that instruction, be there for other people to heart and people just saw it and flocked. Um, it starts from the inside out. Um, when someone asks me to sponsor them, it's very different now than it was when I was new. Um, new people will often, not always, will often do very well with someone that's maybe six months ahead, one year ahead, two years ahead. Um, I was someone who loved people who were 20 years ahead, 30 years ahead. I don't know why, I'm just built like it. Other people are not. They can only relate to people who are only a little bit ahead. There are lots of stories of 12-stepping um, where, you know, old-timer and uh, relative newcomer go and 12-step someone. And the, the drunk person can't relate to the old timer, but they can relate to the person that's two weeks sober or six weeks sober or six months sober. Um, today, I tend to redirect new people to someone local, although there are exceptions. And one of the difficulties about talking about sponsorship is it's not a cookie cutter exercise. It's a very, very personal uh, 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 matter with each person it's different with each person that comes to you it's different there are no there are lots of repeating patterns but no one is quite like anyone else what i do establish though is i establish that the person is indeed an alcoholic if it's other fellowships because i go to more than one fellowship uh, most people come with a kind of portfolio of addictions these days it's all very professional. You know, they've got their little list, um, you know, alcohol and food and, and sexual anorexia, apparently a thing. All of these, all of these, the, these things that people have got. I don't worry too much about the list uh, because we'll get to that. 
I make sure there is enough in common that they're going to identify with my experience and I'll be able to get through to them. The reason this is so important, again, end of Dr. Bob's story. He says the reason he clicked with Bill W is not because he knew stuff as though he'd read it in a book. It's because there are lived experiences. And it was the fact that he instinctively understood that Bill knew what he was talking about. And this is key to step two. I believed AA would work for me because I could see it worked for you. And I was like you. If I'm not like you, how do I know it's going to work for me? So there's got to be there's got to be a, a main addiction in common. Um, I always give people a list of um, uh, icebreaker questions. You want to find out as much as possible about the person before you agree to say yes, particularly if, now if they're completely new, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. If they've been around for a while, the reason they're asking you is because it didn't work out with the previous sponsor. And I want to know why, what went wrong. Um, because whatever went wrong with them will go wrong with you unless it's found out and fixed. Um, I used to jump from sponsor to sponsor because I didn't like what one of them said, so I went and got someone else. And what you see, what sponsors have gradually do over time, they figure out what your white whale is. Now, that's an image from the book Moby Dick, which I haven't read. I would act, but it's in the culture, this notion of your sort of nemesis, this, wow. this, so, so uh, the, the, the Ahab, I think he's called in the book, uh, has got this nemesis, this great, he's a whaler, this nemesis is this great white whale, this is great enemy, and I think we have white whales, which are our psychological blocks, which we're holding on to as our identities, and sponsors will eventually find out where they are, and start playing battleships and cruisers and dropping little bombs in the vicinity of the white whale. And when someone got too close, I stuck my middle finger up and went to the next person. Um, I was in a job I hated when I was two years sober. And I said to my sponsor, I can't do this anymore. I hate it. It's horrible. And he said, go and get a new job. Go and do something else. I don't know what I want to do. And I've got to pay my bills. So I have to stay in this job. He said, the universe will provide. And I was so enraged. I put the phone down. I'd never spoke to him again. He was right. Took me another 15 years to discover that was the case. When I was in a job at around eight years sober, nine years sober, um, full of stress, um, high stakes, awful. And I said to Chris, I said, I need to be in a job which is very challenging and very exciting and interesting because I get bored easily. I need a challenge. And he said, there are greater challenges in life than work. And I was so enraged. I put the phone down and I didn't speak to him for two years. So if someone comes to you and they've had one sponsor before, you want to find out what happened. If they've had four sponsors before, you really want to ask very carefully. If they say things like, I just want to make sure you're safe because the last seven sponsors I had weren't safe. Back away slowly. If they think they've seen something special in you, which understands them the way no one else does, you are the last person that should be talking to them. I ask a lot of questions. Um, I ask about medication, not because I, I not because I'm a doctor. I'm not. But if they're out of their good on something, you want to know. If they're on, on antipsychotics, you might want to know so that when they phone up psychotic, you can ask them questions like, are you taking your medication? Have you talked to your psychiatrist in the last six months? There are 
very, very vulnerable people. You need to know what you're dealing with. You need to know how quickly you signpost them to the local mental health services if there's a first sign of trouble. You need to know what you're dealing with. You need to know what addictions they've got, which they're concealing. Most people are concealing some little behavior pattern that they're using to avoid actually facing themselves. Try and try and get them to reveal that, what it is at the beginning. Give them a list. <laughs> Get them to tick off which things they're up to. All of this is useful information. You can't help someone if you don't know what's going on. Um, people have to be willing to go to any lengths. I was a really, I had a really bad case of alcoholism. I had to do an awful lot in order to merely stay sober in 1993 and at other times as well. Also mentally, uh, mentally ill when I got into recovery. Sorry about the noise, I'll stop in a minute. Um, so my first year, I went to a meeting every day. I spoke to several people every day. I did step work every day. I really put my back into it. And this is my approach with people too. If you're willing to put your back into it, I can sponsor you. There are lots of gentle people out there. If you need a gentle process, go and find someone that managed to get and stay sober using a gentle process. But I'm not that person. I tried soft and gentle with myself, did not work. I kept finding myself drunk and arrested, right? It was only... It was only when I fully gave myself to all three sides of the program that I stopped relapsing. So that's what I offer. So I give people a package deal. Uh, I write everything down. Everything I ask people to do, I write it down because people are unable to write things down when you tell them. You need to know this, even if they are a merchant banker or a teacher or an academic, especially academics, they don't know how to write things down accurately that you have just said. They will hear something completely different. Put all instructions in writing. I can't tell you how many arguments this will save. I didn't understand what you wanted me to do. I forgot all of that sort of stuff. Bullshit. Just write it down, send it to them. Um, I give people a full package deal of steps 10, 11, and 12 from, the, from, from day one. Uh, how can they do step 12 if they haven't had a spiritual awakening? They can show concern for other people in recovery. They, let's say they're a week sober, they can help people who are one day sober because they've got really recent relevant experience of being one day sober, right? Um, to give people a, a daily program. I know there are people that wait until they've done step nine before they even start step 10, 11, and 12. If I, at 28 and whatever, however many months sober, 28 years, 11 months sober, if I need to ask God for direction in the morning in, or, in order not to royally fuck up the day, then I think they're going to need that too. Like, they're... So I wouldn't be fine if I didn't ask my higher power and get direction, but they're going to be fine. That makes no sense. Now, obviously, you don't want them communing, communing with, you know, whatever spirits there are on the astral plane. You know, it needs to be really practical. God, what do you want me to do today? Take your daily plan, run it past a grown up. Do your review at the end of the day, run it past two grown ups. Uh, if you get confused or distracted during the day, call a grown up. You know, it's great to have a higher power. It's even better to have some friends and some common sense. If you're new, you probably don't have any common sense. So you better have some good friends um, and pray as well. So I give people a package deal, which basically takes them from first thing in the morning till last thing at night so there is no excuse for as soon as your eyes crack open in the mo morning uh, god please direct my thinking last thing at night spiritual reading until you fall asleep if you read enough spiritual reading eventually you'll fall asleep because it's so boring um everything in between is catered for by the plan for the day um and so when the slip happens because they're going to slip a few don't, but most people will, are going to have a slip at some point. You can say, at which point did you deviate from the plan for the day? 
This is why we need plans for the day. If it's left to, oh, well, I shall just decide what to do by seeing how I feel in the moment. Disaster. My first sponsor, Doug, said the biggest disaster for an alcoholic is unstructured free time. So don't allow yourself any until your marbles have been restored on completion of step nine. You don't get all of your marbles back. You just get enough to play with for the time being. But until then, you need to be shackled into the system. Uh, but that sounds dictatorial. If you have a better idea for staying sober in, in the first year, have at it. <laughs> if you find something that works better than that, great. I haven't. So there we go. And also, as Clancy says... Um, I'm getting. I'm, I'm just getting swearier and swearier. Um, all the spot. So there's no such thing as a dictator sponsor because all the sponsor he has to say is, "Well, fuck you then," and the dictatorship is over. That's the end of it. And then you can go and get, you know, um, soppy Susie or soppy Sally to sponsor you instead. No offense to any actual Susies or Sallies. I'm sure you're 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 strong AAs. But you know what I mean? If if people want a, a, a different approach, there are so many people. There are so many ways of doing it. Go and try. If you don't want this, go and try something else. So I give people a really strong. Um, system. I've tried lots of things over the years. So what I do now is what I find works best with the largest number of people. Um, so what else apart from the daily program? Um, um, a shed load of meetings. Now, because of Zoom, uh, there's no excuse not to go to a couple of meetings a day. On your lunch break at work, you can dial into one for that. You, you can you can do five meetings a week without breaking a sweat. Um, and that's aside from all the face-to-face -face meetings. There's absolutely no excuse anymore not to be embedded in lots and lots of meetings. But it's the step work, which is really the important thing. Um, so I've got all the instructions written down. I send people it, one instruction at a time. They complete the instruction and they call me. Uh, they call me as soon as the instruction is completed. Uh, if they haven't completed it by the next morning, they report in on what they have done by then so there's i find the daily check-in uh, i get people to check in by 10 a.m daily if they're in a different time zone it might be 6 p.m i've got currently a couple of people um, in the 6 p.m time zone and the rest are in the 10 a.m time zone they have to check in by 10 a.m if they can't if they're really genuinely obstructed by something they can send a text explaining why what this does is, you see, most people have terrible resistance to the process because it involves challenging every single belief, thinking pattern and behavior pattern. And all of those constitute, as far as the person is concerned, their identity. So if they let go of that, they're letting go of who they are. So a huge resistance. If you're talking to them daily, you have a chance of catching it before they spin off into the stratosphere and start, send, and start calling you drunk at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, at least if a slip is on, on its way, they will have been warned on several occasions that it is on its way. There's no, there are no sudden slips with this system. It doesn't happen because you're, you've got daily contact. You can see what's going on. You can hear in the voice what's going on. You know, one minute they're enthusiastic. A couple of days later, the sighing starts. Have you ever been on the phone to a sponsor and you tell them something? And, and I listen out very carefully. I say, hey, you just sighed. What were you trying to communicate to me by sighing at that point? Was it dissatisfaction? With I bring it all out into the open. We discuss it. And then you find out what's really going on. Very useful. So listen, don't just listen to what people are saying. Listen to how they're saying it. There was one person once that used to do these funny little pauses. When they didn't like what I said, there was a long pause where they held their breath. And then we discussed that. Once we discussed it, the behavior stopped. Very interesting. Um, it was all a way of subtly signaling they did not like what I just said. If you don't like it, say, I don't like that. And then we can have an adult conversation about it. 
Um, so this has got to work on the basis of openness. I don't hold back and I don't want them to hold back either. If you want to say something, say it, have it out. Um, I don't work up to being upfront and direct with people. They're going to find out eventually. So you might as well tell them at the beginning. If, if you're like me, if, if you're a kind of upfront person. Otherwise, you can rightly be accused of bait and switch. So don't be all cuddly and then turn into, you know, step Nazi in six months' time. You, you give them the, the deal uh, to, to start with. And to that end, I have something which I sort of jokingly refer to as, as the onboarding pack, just like when, you know, someone joins a sort of corporate um, organization. Um, and one of them is this. I make it very clear to people. A, a lot of people have um, authority problems. They have problems with authority figures. They had problems with their parents. I did. Pro I had problems with teachers. I had problems with the notion of a higher power. I've had problems with the laws of physics. I had a very stubborn resentment against Newton's second law of thermodynamics for a couple of years. I got over it. But I have trouble with authority. I don't like things. I don't like a cupboard door that won't shut properly because it is pulling rank on me. So, you know, what is sponsorship? It's, it, it's every authority nightmare you've ever had all rolled up into one person. So you're going to make sure that it's clear what we're here for. We're not here for a historical reenactment of the relationship with your parents. We're here to get business done. We're here to go through the steps and show, I'm going to show you how I apply the steps to practical situations. If you have a practical situation, I'll tell you how I've applied the steps, the traditions and the concepts to that situation. What you do with the advice is up to you, but this is what I would do. I list the things that I'm not, just to make it really clear at the beginning. And here's my list. A sponsor is not an emergency or blue light service, a taxi, a doctor, a psychiatrist, a therapist, an analyst, a nutritionist, a friend, a housing service, an employment agency, a problem solver, a troubleshooter, an untangler of knots, a soothsayer, an oracle, a judge, a moral arbiter, a citizen's advice bureau, a bank, a parent, a power source, a life coach, a motivational coach, or a search engine. We're here to transact business. I'm going to be as friendly as my temperament permits. Uh, but we're not. I remember phoning. Um, I love the, this particular story. Poor old Brian. He doesn't come out of this story very well, but he, I don't think he minds. When I was about 13, 14 years sober, I phoned up my sponsor, Brian, and said, hey, could we go for a coffee sometime? I just think it'd be nice to like hang out and you know, have a coffee. And he said, you know, we're not friends, don't you? I did not. I, I had not clicked <laughs> what the nature of the relationship was. And I've been sponsored by all sorts of different people. And all of them at, different, at some point have used the same phrase, very different personalities have used the same phrase, business is business. We're not here for anything except the, the as, as Hanson would say, sticking to the knitting, sticking to the nitty gritty of what we're here for. In particular, friendship, don't do it. Uh, there are very, very occasional exceptions where it works, exceptional circumstances. But even then, uh, I had someone who, who was very successfully a friend of the sponsor for a while. But frankly, when push came to shove, a very difficult situation arose in his life. I immediately kicked him upstairs to be sponsored by my own sponsor, which he was very happy with. And things have worked out very well. At the slightest sign of trouble, they need to be kicked out of the friendship or kicked out of the sponsorship. Sometimes they need you more as a friend more than they need you as a sponsor. Sometimes the friendship is very important. So friendship is not a bad thing. Sometimes you might be the only person that they can be friends with right now, but they could be sponsored by any Tom, Dick or Harry. So sponsorship doesn't always pull rank. You, you, you line up the two options, pick one. Um, what else do we cover in the onboarding process? 
uh, I, I let people know right at the beginning that they are going to experience resistance. So when it comes up, they're not blindsided by it. And um, what I alert people to is how human beings react to being challenged. And it's usually one of the, one of the following responses. Now, if you're a sponsor, listen out for this, because these are signs of resistance on the part of the sponsee. Attack, defense, deflection, denial, excuse, explanation, evasion, and justification. When you hear people saying things like, this, I just really want to make clear, I need you to know that. I just want to say, all these are they're subtle, but what they mean is, I don't like what you just said. You need to adjust your attitude, oh sponsor of mine, and you're going to use my material to do it. Uh, I listen very carefully. You can hit the, the timbre of the voice. Uh, the little yes, but machine is one that you get. Yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. And I respond to, if I hear the word but, I say what Jim W says, which is, um, if ifs and buts were candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. And I keep saying that until the word but disappears. <laughs> um, I watch out for the four R's, reaction, resistance, rejection, and reproach. If I encounter reaction, resistance, rejection, reproach, I press the pause button and say, hey, I'm observing which one of those it is. I'm observing some resistance here. I'm, I'm observing that I, what I've heard is that you just rejected what I've said. Let's come back tomorrow. If you want to come back and carry on discussing this, come back with a different attitude. If not, that's fine. I wish you well. See you around but I'm not going to proceed. I'm not going to fight you. Uh, if it's really bad, I, I've, there are exercises I can give people. Sometimes, you know what? A lot of people are really good at admitting that they're being resistant when it's called out in a, in a just an ordinary business-like matter-of-fact way. Hey, a bit of resistance going on here, matey. I've got little worksheets I give people on how to work through resistance, how to work through unwillingness, how the ego will uh, make you push back against things in ways that you don't even notice are operative. And often that works very, very well. People do get past the resistance, but what they'll often need to do is work through that with their little friends in AA. Do not work through the resistance with the person that you're resisting. It doesn't work. And I, I know because I've tried it. I occasionally make mistakes and try it again. It's never worked. You get them to work through it with someone else. Make up their mind. I'll tell you the reason why. Uh, it's just a guess, but I think it's correct. When I'm more enthusiastic about their recovery than they are, we have a real problem. Because now part of them wants to get well, part of them doesn't. If you take the side of the part that wants to get well, you're now, you're now part of their internal conflict. And imagine a boxing ring, blue corner, red corner. If you take the blue corner of wanting to get well, and uh, they notice that, they will automatically side with their ego with the part of them that doesn't want to get well in trying to convince them you're pushing them further into the arms of their ego. If you withdraw from the battle, the conflict necessarily remains inside them. And then they have to pick a side, and then they're much more likely to pick the side of their own best interests. It's very interesting. That's why I withdraw. Sometimes I do a timeout of 24 hours, 48 hours, one week or two weeks. I do this when there is when people don't call in, it's because there's basically a fundamental willingness problem. Now, people will always come to you with 10,000 excuses as to why um, that they couldn't. You know, the bus was late. I was called by work. The cat was sick. The dog was sick. My wife was complaining. There are a thousand reasons why. But the fact is, when I need to make a phone call, 
I find a way to make that phone call. If I really can't make the phone call, I find a way to send a text. I do it under the table where no one can see. Do you know what I mean? You, if you really want to, you can do it. And I suggest to people they use the same ingenuity, resourcefulness and willfulness that they were apt to display when trying to contact their dealer. Have you ever known someone that, like, you know, you... If the first off license is shut, do you just go home? Oh, I'm not going to drink today. No, off license was shut. <laughs> when they call and don't leave a message, whatever your system is, I, I have the system call, text for call back if you don't get through. What people will want to do is uh, call so that they can say to themselves they've tried but they will do everything to avoid actually getting through. So what I tell people is your job is not just to, not just to dial the number by 10 o'clock. Your job is to ensure that the conversation is adequately completed by 10 o'clock, which means you have to be prepared maybe to call several times, to leave a message, to make sure your line remains free so you can be called back. And when you're called back, you have your pen, you have your piece of paper, you have your, your big book, you have your step work, you are somewhere quiet or somewhere quiet enough. You've turned the incoming calls off so your boss can't put, do you know what I mean? All a person has to do is show the same willingness that I showed when I needed a drink. That's it. We're not asking for any more. And the fact is, you have to be pretty tough to get through alcoholism. You have to be pretty resourceful. You have to, you have, to have some ingenuity. You have to have some, some, some staying power. You have to have all of these skills to get through. Deploy those skills now. Um, to sum up on the resistance, you want to watch out for Jedi mind tricks. Now, it's a little Star, Star Wars reference. Not everyone gets Star Wars. Jedi, J-E-D-I, justification, explanation, defense, and intentions. I didn't do it because. I couldn't do it because. Um, I intended to do it. I now intend to do it. <laughs> Listen out for those. And also, I, I have to listen out for those in myself with other people. When I go into justification, ex explanation, defense, or intentions, I ask myself, did anyone ask me to justify myself, explain myself, defend myself, or express my intentions? If not, I'm trying to manipulate the person. Um, Almost without exception, my sponsees, the people I've tried to sponsor over the years, are even the most resistant ones are less resistant and less rude and less generally awful than I was in my first 10, 15 years. This is how I'm able to sponsor people is because I've been that bad and way worse. Um, what else do we need to know? Um, the... Let me just have a look at my, my notes. Um, problem solving. One of the things that people will do, people have different, people are broken in different ways. One way in which people are commonly broken is uh, they do everything themselves and they call their sponsor once a year and that's it. Other people, the slightest thing happens, they pick up the situation, they carry it to the phone, they launch the situation down the phone line. Now it's yours, it's yours to solve. Um, what you want to strike for um, uh, is some middle ground where people come to you with stuff, but they process the situation they want input on as best they can, given their knowledge, their experience, their progress through the steps, their resources, their reading of the literature, their quiet contemplation of the situation, so that you don't have to do all of their thinking for them. Uh, you can tell when people are trying to put onto your plate as a sponsor something they should be thinking through for themselves because your body will tense up.
because you feel that you're taking there at some point you you know you're being taken advantage of now people aren't being taking advantage of you to be mean it's just they're badly trained as i was so what i've had to learn to do with people is to um uh give them the tools to work through situations themselves and then my job as a sponsor is to listen to the best they can come up with of the analysis of the situation how to apply the program to it and then i can take them further and spot gaps if i had to do all the preliminary processing i'd spend my whole life on the phone i can't do that and also it doesn't do them any good people need to grow the f up and one last thing before we go on to questions and answers. The AA program starts on page 63 of the big book. Everything up to then is chit-chat about steps one, two, and the preparation for step three. The business of the program starts on page 63. Within six pages, six pages, so six pages into the program, it's given you a full and adequate answer to all resentment, all emotional upset, fear, your own bad behavior, and problems. It gives you a problem-solving matrix on page 69. You take the sex inventory questions and the solution of the sane and sound ideal and how to grow towards it, and you apply it to the problems. Can't tell you how many people I've come across who are 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years sober that say things like, I'm full of resentment, I'm full of fear, I've been through the steps many times. I'm like, no, you haven't. You may have done some mechanics, but if you're not aware and are not on a daily basis practicing the entry-level solutions in the first six pages of the program, I don't know what you've been doing, but it hasn't been the program. There's a collective failure to, in my opinion, a collective failure to grow up and dignifying of resentment and fear as kind of natural, inevitable states that alcoholics have to kind of somehow learn to manage and live in. I don't believe that anymore. Um, I, my attitude with fear, my sponsor explained this to me. You may need to, I don't know if you'll want to write this down. It may be helpful. He explained very carefully, um, fuck fear. You've got God on your side now. And if you've got a resentment, go to the top of page 67. How can I be helpful? God save me from being angry. This is a sick person. I will be done. And you say it and you say it and you say it until you feel love for the person. Now, it doesn't mean you become a sap. doesn't mean you become a doormat. doesn't become, mean you become all like flowers around the door. But it means you have an attitude of, of love. And what is love? I'll finish on this and then we'll go on some questions if there are any. Uh, love is not getting naked with people. Love is not attraction. Love is not entanglement or enmeshment or sentiment or platitudes or soppiness or sappiness or Valentine's Day or gooiness or pity or sympathy or any of those things. It's active concern for another human being's welfare. And the measure of a person's love, in my belief, is how much of their day they devote to actively working for the welfare of other people. That is love. It may be sugar-coated, or it might not be. Often what I believe is love does not feel like love at the time and does not look like love. But when you look back, you think, my God, that helped me more than anything in my life. Most of the things which have helped me more than anything in recovery, they felt like hell at the time. But those people were so concerned with my welfare, they risked losing my approval of them and indeed the relationship with them to deliver what they thought I might need to hear in order not to die of alcoholism. That is love and that's what sponsorship is about. So don't get into it if you want to make friends or get approval because you won't. People will, you'll get a reputation. But if you care, if you care more about helping people than your reputation, by all means, sponsor away. So, Patrick, I'll, I'll uh, open it up to, I'll hand it back to you to open up the question and answer session. 
Thank you, Tim. Wonderful stuff. Um, and uh, question and answers is open by raised hand. Or like I said earlier, remember, you've been recorded audio only. It's going out to lots of people in our group. So if you prefer not to be recorded, send your, uh, send your uh, message and chat to Tim with your question. And with that, uh, Jules is the timer. We like to keep it to a minute or two at the most uh, for the questions. And um, over uh, raised hand, raised virtual hand, or, you know, if you don't know how to do that, do something like this, or we'll try and figure it all out. But I think most of you know how to do it. Thank you. Over to, back to you, Tim. And you'll call on people, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to whip through these answers as quickly as possible in order to get through as many questions as possible. And if we run out of questions, we can go home and have our tea. So um, what does it say here? Um, it seems like you have a very good system for sponsorship. Well, thank you. How long did it take you to get there? And what was the thing that helped you the most to get there? Um, when I was about 15, 16 years sober, I got seriously big booked. I was kind of like good old fashioned traditional like right wing AA so like very very service oriented not very you know not very soppy but service 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 and I sponsored a few people maybe sponsored five or six people at a time I got to um, 15 16 years sober I overhauled my own program big book tapes that's another story um but I thought I want to base my life around helping other people. And I got to a point within a few months, I was sponsoring 15 people, 16 people, 17 people. The system that worked with two or three or five was creaking. The most important thing was getting more sponsees than I could handle, having to figure out how I could get good, better, as good results or actually better results with more efficiency from my point of view. There's an awful lot. There was an awful lot of wasted time. There was an awful lot of doing things for sponsees they could have and should have done for themselves. Go and get the detachment sheet from Al-Anon. Ask your local friendly Al-Anon meeting for the detachment sheet. They can look it up in the literature catalog. It's got basically the do's and don'ts of there are perfect for sponsorship. It's a it's about the boundary of who is responsible for what. Um, the system that I use is in perpetual beta, as computer people will, will say. In other words, it, there's never a final release. It's always being developed. There are little tweaks that happen. Uh, I'm getting a lot of Al-Anon sponsors at the moment. I don't know what that says about my life. Obviously, I'm in trouble. Um, but it means that I'm having to really revise a lot of the way that I'm doing the Al-Anon stuff because of the volume of people coming in. So I'm doing the Al-Anon stuff very differently now than I did maybe two years ago. Um, uh, so it's by having this as my number one priority, going to my higher power. How can I do this smarter? How can I do this better? How can I do this more efficiently? How can I do this more harmoniously? How can I... Uh, fall out with sponsees less how can i keep the peace but get the job done whenever something goes wrong i post mortem it and say what could i have done differently to have got a better result or not have got a bad result um it's constant self-examination so the self constant self-examination with the program is not like endlessly i'm resentful at blah, blah, i'm frightened no, no no it's examining exactly how i behave that day and how i would behave differently if i could go through the situation again 99 percent of my inventory should not be about my feelings it should be about my conduct and that approach really works um aaron you've got a question thank you quick question you spoke about 10 11 and 12 and exposing the new man or woman to other center where can i find that at? i'm on your website is it on your website or is it something you specifically send to individuals how can i get that i can't hear you uh, yeah forgetting for, for getting them into 10 11 and 12 um, I mean, basically, I get people to do pages 84 to 88 of the big book, and it's flesh. I send them a note with some basic instructions about how to do that. But if they just basically do 84 to 88 and gather around them people who are newer and share their current experience, you're just as far ahead. You don't even need to make it. You just give them those four pages of the book and give them the names and numbers of people who are willing who can who can be step buddies who can talk through that stuff on a daily basis so they've got a little gang of people around them to help them they're not 100 percent dependent on you. you should never have sponsors sponsees dependent on you they should it takes a village you need 
to get people in a network of people who are doing the program at least in a similar way so they're getting input from lots of different angles right you might be directing on how to go through the steps but they're getting input from people especially people who are just a little bit further um ahead um oh there's some really really good uh question here let's make sure i'm not missing any out uh came in late is this sponsorship style for Al-Anon as well as AA yes although the urgency is different with Al-Anon the one big difference uh, it is urgent to get through the steps but I've, my experience of the Al-Anon program is that it's like 50% steps and 50% those daily reading books applying those on a daily basis to the stuff that comes up and learning Al-Anon situation by situation by situation by like endless case studies I don't I I push alcoholics, but I don't push Al-Anons. There's, I, my experience is there's a lot more complexity with the Al-Anons. The alcoholics were drunk for you know five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You're basically dealing with a completely unreconstructed 14-year-old most of the time. They're messy, but they're pretty straightforward. The Al-Anons have been conscious 24 hours a day for 10, 20, 30 years, being fucked around by alcoholics. The complexity there is unbelievable. So it takes a lot longer to peel back the layers and get to the truth. So I'm a lot gentler with the, I don't push with the Al-Anons. Uh, it's it's a, it is a it's a different approach, but it's one that has to be, I'm afraid, learnt on the job. Uh, question from someone: What are your thoughts on page ninety six? You might try to help him getting a job or give him a little financial assistance through. We seldom allow an alcoholic to live in our homes for a long time. Okay, I my this is one the one paragraph in the big book which has got klaxons round it. Do not give them money um if you buy them di- occasionally you buy someone dinner but then it must never be mentioned again and they must buy someone else dinner to pay to to as it were pay it forward rather than pay it back i'm very skeptical about even doing that uh people didn't so much do that for me and the ones that tried to or did Boy, did I play them for everything they had. So I do not do it. The ones that, you know, I, I lived with alcohol. I, I, people let me live with them, turn up at midnight and sleep on their sofa. It didn't do me any good. Um, also, these days, the 1930s are very different than today. 1930s, it was the middle of the, of, of, of the Depression. Um, there are public agencies today which did not exist in the 1930s, which are specially designed to help people in serious trouble. So what I do today is I help people access those agencies. Um, no one gave me money. What people did do, they gave me the names and addresses of job agencies where if you turned up at six o'clock in the morning and were at the front of the queue, they would give you work for that day. Then you would have the money that you're asking for. So I help people access the help that is there from the legitimate sources. I do not become the source of the help under any circumstances. Um, I, I'm, oh, I'm going to tell a terrible trade secret. And this is, this is going (laughs) to, this this is taped as well. So here we go. Um, My other half doesn't like AA members being in our home because he doesn't like the energy they bring. Uh, I don't, so I don't even have, uh, people around to my house we if we meet we meet out we go for walks walks are great because all of the toxic stuff gets taken away on the wind um so no i don't have them live with me uh, when i've seen people do that it's almost always a disaster so so um yeah i'm just seeing if there are any other question nothing else in the chat that i can see debbie what's your question Hi, thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, mental health. Get people yeah. coming saying I've got a, a range of a range of uh, diagnosed things. I have so far been quite tender with that, um, but I wonder if actually I'm doing any favours. <sighs> yeah. So this is a thorny question. Yeah, I'm very aware of this situation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the situation is very difficult. Um, the only reason I didn't have diagnosis when I came in was not because I was ill. What well, wasn't ill, I was, 
but I was evasive and elusive and I couldn't be pinned down fast enough for a proper diagnosis to be carried out. So I whizzed in and out of different surfaces and out of, in and out of different offices. Um, I was extremely unwell. And what people did with me was they said, right, you might struggle more to do the things we're asking you to do. It may take longer for you to get the hang of those things, but you still have to learn how to do them. Now, it's not the diagnosis per se. Uh, uh, and now I've, I, something I did, so I, I'm, uh, uh, I have Asperger's. And uh, a lot of the behaviors and even the thinking patterns and the attitudes have been gradually trained out of me over the decades in AA. Um, uh, the, the ones that weren't doing me any favors, there are some things which actually work to my benefit, so I, I've kept those. Um, but at times, I have brandished my Asperger's as a defense against accusations of misbehavior. Well, I'm only doing it because this is my autism that I'm... No. If I've got the diagnosis, uh, it may explain why I behave a certain way, but it does not remove my responsibility for cleaning up the mess I create because of what I do. And also, um, the treatment... I, I had uh, catatonic depression, suicide attempts, all sorts of antisocial behaviour, all sorts of things. Um, uh, panic attacks, self-harm. It's, it's not a pretty roster. Um, the, my, the solutions that I was given in AA, funnily enough, they did work on those, but very, very slowly. My last panic attack was when I was 16 years sober. So I had to buckle up because it was going to be a rough ride, not as rough as dying of alcoholism, mind. So I was still better off than drunk but it was my it yeah I got, okay so it's my diagnosis I'm now responsible for it I'm responsible for doing my best to alter my attitudes my beliefs my values my thinking and my behavior and yeah I need to give myself a break because it's going to be way tougher uh, for me than it is for other people fine but it was my job so I wasn't to beat myself up for it, but I wasn't to let myself off the hook. Um, it's very interesting. There are, um, there are some diagnoses that get um, brandished a lot by way of defense, and there are others that don't. I've never heard anyone use as a defense. And people, sponsees who've been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, have ne the ones who've had that diagnosis have never said, Oh yeah, I can't do that because I'm I'm narcissistic. It's very interesting. Um, uh, and I I mean I had behaviours which I'm being told by professionals uh, fit into OCD. So I had all sorts of of counting things going on and checking things and not being able to walk on the cracks in the pavement and all sorts all sorts of things. Um, and. Uh, people's advice, it, they, they didn't say stop it and expect me to stop it straight away, but they gave me gentle tools for gradually learning how to change what thoughts I permit to run in my mind, to choose which narratives I was going to believe, which ones I was going to disbelieve. So with me, the AA program worked not because it's some great sort of advanced psychotherapy. It's because it covers all areas of my life. It covers the social, the practical, the physical, the mental, the religious, the spiritual, the moral, and the philosophical. And my mental problems, the problems manifested in the area of my mind, but their origin lay in each of those eight areas. And my first sponsor, who was a doctor, said, well, I said, I'm depressed. Uh, and, and he didn't give me a formal diagnosis. He, he agreed that if I, you know, I, I, look, I presented as someone who was clinically depressed. Being clinically depressed simply would mean that I meet the clinical diagnostic criteria. It doesn't mean I have this separate disease entity in me. Um, he, my sponsor, also, a doctor said, uh, 
yeah, you're depressed, but you're depressed because your life is depressing. If I had your life, I'd be depressed too. It is the way you are living. Would you like to learn how to live differently so you are less depressed? I'm still prone to anxiety. I'm still prone to depression. But I know how to handle it when it comes up. When, when it's on its way, I know how to stop it in its tracks. If it gets a hold, I know how to get out of it. So it's never, it's not an excuse. It's just, a, it's rough. You say to me, it's rough. You've got it rough, fine. But there are lots of other people who've got it rough. Find other people in recovery who found ways around this. I know someone in recovery who's got ki kids with ADHD, who's, who, who can explain how she's worked with her kids to work around lots of the behaviors to live with uh, these conditions in a way that doesn't affect their behavior. I'll share one up. This is such an important topic. I hope you don't mind me going on a little bit more about it. My friend Sarah got sober with me. She used to, she used to work in the stables, um, get drunk every night, woke up covered in pasta was one of her stories. Uh, she got sober the same time as me, age of 21. And she became uh, a clinical psychologist. And she works as a clinical psychologist uh, in mental health hospitals in London. I won't say which one. And she treats people with OCD and with schizophrenia and with psychosis. And uh, she successfully treated many patients with these conditions such that their, symptom, uh, their symptoms were still there, but reduced to subclinical levels. So they weren't at a level that they were impairing their experience of life and I was talking to I've talked to a lot about this and I said what do you do because people are amazed at how quickly there are people she's had patients who had OCD for 40 years there was one who was actually he's in the literature as patient n whatever and she he came to her and within six weeks his OCD was down to subclinical levels and I said, where do you get your material? What do you do with them? She said about 40% of it is AA stuff, stuff she learned in AA. 60% uh, of it is, is other things she's learned during the course of her work. Um, so my, what I get from that is my mental health issues are not death sentences. They're not prisons that I have to languish in the rest of my life. They may be predispositions. They may have flare-ups. I may have a rough time, but there are ways of living with these and having the symptoms reduced to a level, in my case, is not, not, not about other people, in my case, uh, where I, I, was, I was okay. One last thing. If there's the slightest sign of the risk to themselves or others, you make sure that they've got their doctor informed, their psychiatrist informed, that they've got the numbers of the mental health services and the next of kin in their pocket. So if they're found doing whatever in the street, this happened, I've actually seen this happen. Um, the first aid people can look in their pocket, call the family when they're unable to communicate because they're having an episode. You, you, you help people with really practical things so they get all of the help that they need. People will need a lot of outside help for some of these things. But it's not a defense against the program. That's the big message. Um, Ian, would you like to come in? Thank you, Tim. I thank you for everything that you've spoken about tonight. I came in, I rolled in a little bit there. I hope I didn't miss this. I don't think you talked about this. But I just wondered about your experience of the um, the instruction on 95. It talks about if he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval, you know, about reading from the preface to a vision from you and ask them to, you know, what they, how they felt and thought and drank, you know, as the instructions go. Um, what your experience with that is? Yeah, as a, as a, yeah. As, as a you know, perspective spot seat, you know what I mean, before you Absolutely. go into work. So I, I, I never used to do that. I do that now with everyone. Read the book up to the end of actually Dr. Bob's Nightmare I give them. Um, and if they're willing to do that, they're usually willing to do the steps. Three out of four don't finish the book. But often, what I used to find is that I would get like deep into weeks and sometimes months of discussions only for the step work to grind to a halt because they're unwilling to do the work. They wanted a personal relationship 
They wanted some, basically some of your power, some of your connection to the higher power, which they're siphoning off for themselves. If people can demonstrate that they're able to do the work, and if they can't, some people can't read. So you fi I find out, are you able to read? If not, it's fine. We can get you some tapes, listen to the tapes. I don't care how they absorb the material. I don't care how long they take to do it. One person took six weeks to read up to Dr. Bob's Nightmare for a whole host of reasons. Fine. He got there, and now we're working the steps. He's doing amazing work. But it's a wonderful exercise. Um, what I'm looking for when they finish that is a reaction. One person, I mean, I'm sure they're well-meaning, but I said, so what was, your, what was your reaction to that? Oh, it was nice, you know. Oh, I quite liked it. Well, I'm not the right person for you, pumpkin. Go, go and find someone. When I read that, I was horrified. I was horrified at what the program was asking me to do. It's not nice. It's horrific. Alcoholism is horrific. The solution is unthinkable. If you're not filled with hundreds of conflicting emotions uh, by getting to the end of Dr. Bob's Nightmare, go and read it again. And I've said to people, read it a second time. Let's see if it has any impact the second time. And then, then we get somewhere. Um, someone said, how often do you talk to your sponsees? Uh, okay, so when they're doing the steps daily, if they, if they break off the daily calls, the deal is off. Um, uh, a couple of warnings. It's not first strike and you're out, but we, we I bre basically it breaks off. Once they get to um, uh, step 12, uh, I, there are lots of exercises I give people for uh, the traditions and the concepts. We move to once a week. After that, we move to ad hoc. They call when they need to. Um, uh, uh, the daily check-in is absolutely a phone call. Uh, a text only in extreme circumstances where they're absolutely prevented. But if the texts keep happening, we have a conversation about why the text, why its circumstances keep preventing the person from calling. Um, what if someone's asked, what in your opinion helps to determine if someone is constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves? That's a, God, that's a good question. Um, to go back slightly to Debbie's question, the people with very serious mental health problems, I actually don't really have, uh, I don't experience as, as being the most difficult by any stretch of the imagination. There is a particular class of serial relapser, and I think I was in this class myself. Excellent intentions, very firm commitment, front of the bus kid, you know, best performance in the class for about two days. And then there was like Homer Simpson gradually backing into the hedge until you can't see him anymore. Disappearance, slip, return, remorse, tears. I've let everyone down. I hate myself so much. I'll never do it again. I really want, I really intend to do it right this time. I'm really going to commit. And then the whole cycle starts again. It goes round and round and round. Uh, when that keeps happening, let them go after the first, after the next slip, because whatever, whatever they're doing with you, you're the cover for their drinking because they can say, look, I tried AA and it failed. Look how hard I tried and it failed. It's to get rid of the guilt for drinking that they have periodic bouts of sobriety. You're part of that dance. The well-known stages of the spree. The, today, sprees include little bursts of AA to get everyone off their backs. I did it in, in the early 90s, so I know other people do it too, and people have admitted as much. They always eventually admit that. Um, some people are struggle great i think we all i struggle with self-honesty 
Uh, I mean, I'm embarrassed about my first 25 years of recovery. I really am. Uh, because of my, my, my self-delusion, I will, when I'm 35 years, if I get that far, God willing, I will be embarrassed about everything I'm saying today because I, I'll think I was so deluded. Fine. So everyone has, a tro- has trouble with self-honesty. That's why we're on this plane is because we're trapped in a dance with the ego trying to avoid God. That's why we're here. So Fine. Everyone has a problem with honesty. What I find is with the, dis- with the dishonesty, uh, what is honest is action. If the action is taken, there is honesty at some fundamental level. So you watch, you listen to what they're doing, to, not to what they're saying. And I run a little, me- well, help, some bit friends help me. I set up this little meeting, 7 a.m. every morning, um, 20 minutes We read a little passage from the big book, another spiritual reading from all sorts of resources, you know, from Kierkegaard to Parks and Recreation, two minute shares to 20 past seven, we're done. We go and get on with our days. Um, If you want to test willingness and honesty, you you say to people, come to that every day for one week, 7 a.m., camera on, bright eyed, bushy tailed, raring to go the ones that can do that for one week will be able to do the steps the ones that can't or won't will not be able to uh if there's the slightest doubt about willingness honesty straightforwardness sincerity i set them that simple little exercise uh and it never fails it never fails because resistance will always come out in being unable or unwilling to attend that meeting. And I got the idea from Don P, Don P of Aurora, Colorado, who would sponsor people according to his tapes. By They would have to come to his house at 6 a.m. He had five slots. He would take five people through at a time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or whatever the days were. And if you missed your slot... It would be offered to someone else. You're now blown it. I mean, much tougher than what I do, but the principle is the same. The 7 a.m. thing is brilliant because almost no one has to be at work at 7 a.m. Often people have to be at work at 8, but fine. If they have to be at work at 8 a.m., uh, you know, they can, oh, I have to travel. Oh, well, what you can do, you can get the train so that you arrive at your destination at 7 a.m. So you can come off the train, sit in a cafe, sit in a park, dial into the meeting. There is always a way around it. If someone is willing, they will find a way. And it's only 20 minutes. You can even dial in while you're giving breakfast to the kids. Simple as anything. The 10 o'clock call, simple as anything. Call between 7.45 and 10. It's a broad enough window to allow anyone a chance. Um, I'm going to share something a friend gave me. Central Intelligence Agency. Um, On the CIA, yes, the CIA website, there's a, a notice which says, The title is Lack of Responsiveness. Throughout this process, we expect quick responses and for you to keep your appointments with us as best you can. If there is anything happening in your life that might interfere with your responsiveness, we recommend waiting to apply until you are ready. So I say to people, look, if these things are genuinely getting in the way, if your wife, your husband is not letting you do what is being suggested in a go and sort that out first how you sort that out is up to you but this isn't working go and sort out what your priorities are and then come back and that works and sometimes people come back and they've sorted it out but i do not battle on you can't push treacle up a hill and i can't be more enthusiastic about people's recovery than than they are so i've gone over time i think that's it for questions so i think patrick over to you
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.